It's honestly an honor and a privilege to be um, speaking over here, of course, in the House of the Specialists. I'll be um, talking today about interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, and my talk is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, <coughs> a deadly disease. First of all, I have no complex of interest or any of label promotion of medications. I just want to say that I'm a co PI on the PFILD study. Um, UK is a recruitment site for nintenadib, one of the antifibrotic drugs for patients who have non-UIP progressive fibrosis, and I'm a co-PI on, um, on this study. So first of all, as an outline, what I'll be talking about is what is IPF? What are the risk factors for um, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis? What, how to work up or how to walk through a diagnostic workup for interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. What is the course? How sick are those patients? And what do we have to offer this population nowadays? <coughs> I took those quotes from, uh, from a paper that was published in the Journal of Advanced Nurses back in 2015. Those quotes were taken from actual patients who have pulmonary fibrosis and you guys are going to see those quotes throughout my presentations. So Bridget says, some kind of fibrosis. So I just kept going to the clinic, and they did lung function, which at the time were quite low. Then he decided to refer me to Dr. X's clinic, and then we found out that I was too bad for the trial. And this is not uncommon. We see those patients pretty fairly in our clinic. So what's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? It's a specific form of chronic, fib chronic progressive fibrosing interstitial pneumonia of unknown cause, it's of unknown cause, occurring in adults, mainly in patients who are more than 65 years old. It's very important, and I'm gonna emphasize this throughout my talk several times, that we exclude other forms of interstitial pneumonia, and thus the name idiopathic. I took this from the ATS ERS consensus, consensus statement that was published back in 2002, and this to highlight where idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis lies. It's part of the, the interstitial pneumonias, and it's very important to work on excluding the other form the other types of interstitial lung disease before saying this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because treatment changes, prognosis is different. How common is it? So this paper was published in Lancet back in 2014. It's a retrospective, it was a retrospective study. It looked into the ICD-9 codes of um, a Medicare database of patients who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what it showed is that the incidence throughout a decade, from 2000 to 2011, has not changed much, despite us learning more and more about the disease. So the question is, why are we not getting those patients, or why are we not being able to identify those patients early? But what's interesting is that the prevalence increased with age, sorry, it increased with um, time, part of, which, part of which could be explained by we might be taking better care of those patients, we might be doing something for those patients that are helping them live more. And this is the incidence and prevalence by geographical area. And this is what, what we have in the state of Kentucky, the Incidence is between 85 to 96 per 100,000 person years, so we lie in the middle when compared to other states. And regarding the prevalence, we do a good job, 500 to 550 per 100,000 people, and this is, we are within the um, highest states that, in which this disease is prevalent. So who's at risk? Men? Those who are old, more than 65 years old, it's rare, it's rare for a patient to have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis if he was less than 50 years old. You're going to need to sit and think and look into other causes 
for what's going on before you say this patient has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Smoking, smoking, and smoking is a big risk factor. Occupational exposures, such as farming, livestock, raising birds, wood, metal dust, hairdressing, stone cutting and polishing, vegetable dust, and animal dust. Not only that, but also viruses, such as human herpes viruses, have been shown to be a risk um, factor for patients to develop idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, mainly CMV, EBV, and HHV8, as well as hepatitis C. Reflux, GERD, and then 5 to 10 percent familiar. <coughs> this is a simplified, very simplified actually, um, diagram of how the pathophysiology is. First of all, you have exogenous as well as endogenous stimuli. Patients get exposed to dust, they get exposed to fumes, they smoke, drugs, viruses. All of those lead to, and over time, we're looking at repetitive microscopic lung injury that are separated by time as well as um, space. In a patient who has a genetic predisposition, they end up having um, the lung heals, but those who are genetically predisposed, their healing is aberrant, thus they end up having tissue lung disease. And to complicate the picture a little bit, this is a more complex slide of how idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis happens. You have patients who are genetically susceptible, who are old. They have recurrent microinjuries to the epithelium. This leads to recruitment of the fibroplasts and activation and leads to fibrosis. And then it's a closed loop and you continue having the fibrotic disease. And this has changed throughout the years. So initially back two decades ago or Nearly a decade ago, it was thought that this was an inflammatory disease. And as we learn more about it, we, we know more, more now that it's more of a fibrotic disease. And why is that important? It's because at one point, anti-inflammatory drugs were used to treat this disease. But now we're looking into antifibrotics to help treat this disease. Or slow down the progression of this disease. It started with a cough. I was getting a bit breathless going upstairs, being typical. From there on, the journey to diagnosis was variable, usually causing anxiety and frustration. Participants described a lengthy day from being treated in primary care initially for asthma, COPD, or recurrent chest infections before being referred to a local chest physician. And this is common to those patients. They, they end up in the ER, they end up getting a course of steroids, end up in primary care clinic, on inhalers, they have a long course before they end up in our clinics. And this is the main reason I'm doing this talk today. It's because it's very important to increase awareness, it's very important to educate, and it's very important to know about this disease. And this is a Kaplan-Meier plot of survival probability curve. It says that from the time of onset of symptoms, from the time patients start having symptoms, we're looking at nearly an 81-month median survival. And from the time their initial visit to their doctor, we're looking at nearly a 35-month 35 um, 35 median survival. So the earlier we get them, the better. The earlier we recognize them, the better. How do they present? They present with vague symptoms. Dyspnea upon exertion is usually gradual. Patients have shortness of breath. They start accommodating their life with their shortness of breath and until it starts getting bad, till they start seeing someone. Non-productive and dry cough. Reduced exercise tolerance. And the bread and butter of what internists end up having, increased anxiety, fatigue, depression, and chest pain. Most of which of those are, are less common, but that's how some patients also present. So there's a lot of vague symptoms of which those patients present with. Then we examine those patients. It's very important that we examine those patients thoroughly. If we start, if we listen to their lungs and we hear enteric crackers, mainly on the lower lobes or lower um, um, lung bases, if you look 
and we find that the patient has finger clubbing. And that happens in nearly 50% of patients who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Then we start thinking and we start narrowing our differential towards are we dealing with a interstitial lung disease? Are we dealing with mainly a lung problem? And then, and then we start, once we narrow that differential down, we start looking into other signs of connective tissue diseases. And why, why is that? Because, as I said earlier, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we need to exclude other forms of interstitial pneumonia, other form of interstitial lung diseases. So look for joint swelling. Look for tightening of the skin. If we found peripheral edema with lung crackles, with clubbing, are we dealing with an ILD with a concomitant pulmonary hypertension, right-sided um, heart failure? Non-invasive testing. So what do we see on the lung function test, pulmonary function test? We'll see a normal or increased ratio of FEV1 over FVC. A reduction in the forced vital capacity. A reduction in total lung capacity. And a reduction in the diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. This is a picture of me doing lung function tests. I did as part of um, a project for the American College of Chest Physicians. It's it's not an easy test, to be honest with you. Every, every test we ask patients to do, we, we put them through a burden, too. <clears throat> and then, if we are fortunate enough to have some imaging on, on first presentation, this is, this is not an, obviously, this is not a normal x-ray. We see fibrotic pattern, mainly on the lung bases, could even call off honeycombing. And now what to do? We have all this information. We need to sit and talk with the patient more. We need to sit and dig more into his history. We need to look into his social, her social history. We need to look into occupational. Where are you working? In a factory. What's your role in the factory? What are you exposed to in the factory? What's the name of the factory? Then environmental. We need to look into where have you been? Where have you been living? Tell me about your home environment. Do you have any sewer problems? Do you have any mold at home? Pets, what do you have? Birds, great. No, it's not, it's not common that the first, it's not uncommon to see a patient where at the first presentation is gonna tell you no for every, anything. And then on subsequent presentation, or maybe with a different physician, they're gonna tell, oh yeah, I have, I've had birds taking care of them for a million years. Um, so it's important to dig into all of that And then, and then what? So the ATS ERS also in their consensus statement published in 2011 um, published the following: Do we do a bronchoscopy with bronchalveolar lavage? There was a re weak recommendation towards that, and it was recommended against if you are thinking of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. But if you had if you had it done, you look at the sample. This increases your confidence that, or it will tailor down that that this is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Transbronchial biopsy, would you send them to do a transbronchial biopsy? The, the ATS-CRS consensus statement actually recommended against. And the reason behind that, and I'm talking about interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, but if you're thinking of other diseases like granulomatous diseases like sarcoid, for example, yes, you're gonna need to send them for that. And why, why not in IPF? Because the sample that you take off a transbronchial biopsy, it's a small, small sample, and you need a bigger tissue. Serologic evaluation is recommended, and we're talking about basic rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, ANA, and other serologies based on what you find out on physical exam, as well as what you grasp while taking the history. So, again, for the diagnosis of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, exclusion of other known causes of ILD, domestic and occupational environmental exposure, connective tissue disease, and drug toxicities. And then you have all the data that I just talked about. Looking at a high resolution CT scan, a high resolution CT scan is an advanced CT scan. It gets takes thinner cuts, and you have a better picture of the lung parenchyma. So it helps us evaluate the lung parenchyma better. And plus, minus, a lung biopsy. 
So if you suspected IPF and you talked to the patient for some time and you found an identifiable cause, if you found serology that's positive, you found something that goes with connective tissue disease, for example, then this is not idiopathic. This is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You're done. You follow a different pathway. But if you didn't find an identifiable cause, then you're starting to think, okay, I'm dealing with IPF. What I'm going to do next? High-resolution CT scan. And what we're looking for on a high-resolution CT scan are the following. We're looking for honeycombing. And I'll be talking a little bit more about those terminologies. I know they're Chinese because they were for me at one point in my life. Um, honeycombing, mainly in the bases. Um, reticular opacities. Traction bronchiectasis. This is, this is a small cartoon just to explain what I was talking about. So honeycombing, they're like grapes on top of each other. Interlobular septal thickening, or the reticular opacities, where you have thickening, fibrosis, around the um, lobules of, around the interlobules. And traction bronchiectasis, what happens is that you end up having fibrosis. What the fibrosis does, starts pushing the airways apart, so you end up having traction. <coughs> and this is how the picture of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis looks like. We're looking at basilar honeycombing. We see reticular opacities. And with a story where we excluded other causes of interstitial pneumonia, we'd say, this is definite UIP. We're done. We don't need to pursue this further. If we're not confident enough as clinicians, we could call our chest radiologist. We, we could talk to our chest radiologist. And, and that, that's enough. We stop there. But so the ATS-CRS broke the high-resolution CT scan criteria into three, into three groups. And the reason behind it is if you have all four features of UIP, subplural, basal predominance, reticular abnormalities, honeycombing with or without traction bronchiectasis, and the absence of features inconsistent with UIP, then we're confident enough to say that this is UIP. Because if you do a biopsy on those patients, it's going to come very high probability, very high specificity that this is UIP. But we hope our life is easy. What happens when we see this picture? We don't see any honeycombing over here. We see more white whitening, more haziness towards the bases, then we're not definite this is UIP. So this is where this might fall into one of those two groups. Possible. We're looking into possible UIP pattern now. And that is a sub plural basal predominance, reticular abnormalities, like we saw in the earlier image. There was no honeycombing. And absence of features inconsistent with the UIP pattern. And inconsistent with the UIP, and why is it inconsistent? Because that starts tailoring our diagnosis. That starts leading us to other sorts of pneumonias, interstitial or interstitial lung disease. So if it's in the upper or in the mid lung, if it follows the airways and the vessels, if there is a lot of this whitening haziness, um, ground glass on your CAT scan, there's a lot of small spots, a lot of micronodules, cysts, discrete cysts, mosaic attenuation that goes with air trapping and frank consolidation. All, all of those guide you towards other, other interstitial lung diseases. So what would you do if you end up having a patient within the last two groups? So you did this high-res CT scan and you have a possible UIP. You have a picture that's inconsistent with UIP. Then you, <clears throat> then you go for a lung biopsy. And why, why do a biopsy? To get a clinical pathological diagnosis. Why is that important? It's important because um, it's going to guide your treatment. Why is that important? Because unfortunately those diseases, other ILD diseases, they come with, um, um, treatment comes with risk, comes with side effects. So you want to know what, what you're treating. Not only that because of, but also for um, it's important to detect fibrotic processes related to specific exposure, and that is for compensation implications for the patient, for um, public health consequences for the community, such as in asbestosis. But we need to 
sit and think, and we need to talk to the patient. We need to counsel them because there's no procedure that comes with no risks. So this was, this was a retrospective trial that was published in 2016. They also looked into the ICD-9 codes of patients who have IPF and who underwent a lung biopsy. And those who were sent for non-elective procedure, just for a non-elective biopsy, the mortality was 2%. But those, um, sorry, those who were sent for an elective um, procedure, their mortality was 2%. But those whose procedure was done on a non-elective basis, their mortality was as high as 15%. So it's important to sit and counsel those patients. Um, is there a less invasive than an open lung or a VATS procedure for those patients? Yes, there is. There is cryobiopsy. Um, what's a cryobiopsy? It's, a, it's done under bronchoscopy where you put a cryoprobe, pretty much you freeze the lung parenchyma inside and then you pull it out. You get a bigger tissue. But also, it doesn't come without its risks. This is a retrospective case series that was published in 2017 um, in an um, academic institution, nearly 25 cases, four interventional pulmonologists. Each one did the procedure his own way, and they said that this procedure carries a lot of risk, the most of which is bleeding, um, and with recommendations that you need to have a protocol. Maybe standardization might help decreasing those risks. Um, maybe looking and selecting some patients if they have pulmonary hypertension might, might help in decreasing those risks. And not only that, but also you need to tell the pathologist that you know, we're doing a cryobiopsy, we're not doing an open lung biopsy because the lung, uh, lung parenchyma is also um, crushed. So they need to be aware of that. Great, so we have, we have a biopsy. Um, this is a definite UIP biopsy where you have fibroplastic foci, you have areas of, um, areas of fibrosis. But it's, as it was a bit complicated once we looked at the high resolution CT scan, the, the biopsy also is a bit complicated where unlike other diseases, a biopsy, the biopsy is not the gold standard. It's actually what they label as the silver standard. It's because the pathologist looks at it and he could say this is definite UIP, possible UIP, probable UIP. So how could we know what's going on? So bringing the clinician, bringing the chest radiologist and bringing the pathologist, letting them all sit in one room and talk about the patient and discuss the case is the actual gold standard. So Dr. Flaherty back in um, 2004 published this paper where ended up resulting with the following is, once we put all those disciplines together in one room and they talked with each other, their inter-observer inter -observer agreement, their confidence of the diagnosis went up to nearly um, 88%. And this is what's considered nowadays as the gold standard of how to diagnose IPF in patients who fall into the, mainly into the, to the two other groups, those who are possible and those who are inconsistent with um, UIP. And this, this slide, I just wanted to show you that even the pathologist will give you a differential, and it's based on after you have the most sit with each other, this might change your um, end, end diagnosis. It's nothing more than stress and anxiety. I've always been active, garden, DIY. You know, I do anything around the house. I mean, there was a little job there yesterday, and I had to get Christine. I sort of direct operations now, but physically do it? No. So what's the natural history of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? You have one of three scenarios. You have the lucky patient who's stable. His course is stable. You have those who progress slowly. And you have the unfortunate ones who have rapid, rapid progression. And at any point, they may end up with a flare or an acute exacerbation, and that puts them down the slope. And those patients, they end up not doing well. Several retrospective studies said that there's a median survival time. Median survival time for this disease is two to three years. Pretty much survival time worse than some cancers. 
Because I've been so active, you see. I used to go out and do 40 miles on the bike before I went to work. Then I used to go out and do the same at night. And I've rode across the country in three days and 216 miles in 12 hours. So once, we end, once those patients end up in our clinic, what are the factors, what are the baseline factors that start guiding us, telling us that those patients are not going to do well? How much short of breath they are. If they have a low diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide, it was less than 40%. If they walk for six minutes and their oxygen drops to less than 88%. If they can't walk more than 250 meters on the six-minute walk test. How much fibrosis, how much honeycombing they have on their CAT scan, and whether they have pulmonary hypertension or not. So those tells us that we're looking at a patient who we're getting at a sick, at a sick stage. How about down the road? How would we know who's, not, who's following the either progressive or maybe the rapid progressive um, um, pattern? Those who, on follow-up, they start having more short of breath. Those whose lung function tests start getting worse looking at if there was a drop in their forced vital capacity by more than 10% on six months, if the diffusing capacity drops to more than 10% on six months, if their repeat CAT scan shows worsening of the fibrotic pattern, and if they had a drop, if they dropped more than 50 meters um, walking on the six-minute walk test. And those two is to show you that a decline in more than 10% of the forced vital capacity was associated with increased, increased mortality. So how do those patients die? 77% of them die of respiratory causes. Talking about progressive, progression of their underlying disease, acute lung injury, flare-up or exacerbation of their underlying disease, pneumonia, core pulmonale, non-respiratory causes in 18% of them, cardiac, septic, GI, from a stroke, cancer. So, great, I've been talking for 30 minutes about this disease, how we work it up, how much sick those people are. So, what have we learned about this disease? What do we have now to offer, to offer those people? Antifibrotics. Are they the cure? No, we hope they're the cure, but they're not. Um, so the antifibrotics were FDA approved back in 2014. Actually, they were fast-track approved because that was the only thing that we were able to do to those patients, this, despite the side effects of those um, medications. Antifibrotics are also labeled as disease-modifying therapy. Um, what they do is, or what the trials have showed us they do is, they slow down the drop in their forced vital capacity. They slow down the progression of the disease. In all patients, the answer is no. There are patients who do not also respond to those medications. Um, Nintedanib and perfenidone are the two approved drugs or the two antifibrotics that were approved for pulmonary fibrosis. And why, why those numbers? Because the trials were done on patients who have mild to moderate disease, not severe disease. And those are the side effects. We keep an eye on their lung function tests once we, um, once we start treating them. And it's very common to have GI side effects too. We're looking at diarrhea, nausea, dyspepsia, anorexia. And what to do if patients end up having diarrhea? Sometimes we ask them to take the medication with food. Sometimes we ask them to cut down on the medicine. Sometimes um, in intentative, for example, we ask them to start loperamide, and some patients, they can't just tolerate it. We just stop the medicine or we shift them to the other antifibrotics. And photosensitivity with perfenidone, those are the side effects. And which one to choose? It's um, not by which rep actually comes and knocks on your door. It's a discussion between you and your um, patient. You tell them, about the, um, you tell them about the side effects, and you sit and discuss, and you start, you start them on those medications. And this is what antifibrotics do. The disease-modifying therapy does. It drops your FVC at a slower, slower rate than what your disease ends up dropping your FVC. So it's getting around, I think, is the big chance. Actually, doing jobs. 
You've got to think before you do anything, if you want to. Just nip into the shops. You've got to think, have I enough liquid oxygen? Have I filled the bottle? Have I done this? Have I done that? When I shave, I put me shaving cream on. I've got to take the oxygen off, and I know it doesn't take long. But I can't wait to get the oxygen back on. Thinking about getting an electric shaver, because I can just lie down and use it. So treat, treating IPF is not just giving them antifibrotics. We also need to look into their comorbidities, because treating their comorbidities also comes into their management. And this is, honestly, if you want to help those patients, very important that you look into treatment comorbidities. And it's not just on the um, chest physician. It's also on other disciplines to keep an eye on that, too. Have they taken their vaccinations, their influenza vaccination, their pneumonia vaccinations? Um, do they have coronary artery disease? It's not uncommon that those patients have coronary artery disease. Actually, there is more coronary artery disease in this population. Screening for sleep apnea. Do they have any sleep apnea? Have they been treated for their sleep apnea? Because treatment improves their mortality. It improves their quality of life. Do they have reflux? We need to treat the reflux. There has been several studies looking into reflux and testicular pulmonary fibrosis. More than um, is it a risk? it might lead to further decline in their lung function test, might lead to exacerbation. We need to keep an eye, do they have, because those patients are at increased risk of having lung cancer, do they have a new spot? Are their lymph nodes larger than what we see for interstitial pulmonary fibrosis? If they smoke, counsel to stop smoking. I know it's very hard, but, but we need to sit and counsel them. Do they have concomitant physema? concomitant combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, once they, once they have this disease, they are at a high risk for mortality. That means they, are, they have a bad disease. They have two diseases in one, actually. Um, do they have underlying pulmonary hypertension? We need to be aware of that because those patients are sicker. Is their diabetes under control? All of those we need to keep in mind. With oxygen on, at least, I can get around. Not as fast as normally, but I can get around. And I don't seem to cough as much. If we walk those patients and their oxygen drops to less than 88%, studies have shown that oxygen, giving them oxygen, improves their tolerance. It alleviates their exercise-induced hypoxemia, of course, giving them oxygen. And it reduces their shortness of breath. Refer them to pulmonary rehab because that improves their walk distance. It improves their quality of life. It improves their symptoms. They start developing coping strategies with other patients who have other lung diseases. <laughs> do they have a chronic cough? Most of them do. Did we treat underlying reflux disease? Anxiety, dyspnea, and cough, maybe opiates, could help with that. And it's very important to educate, educate, and educate patients Internet is a beast. They go to the internet, they read a lot of stuff. They come to your office freaking out. You need to sit and talk to them about their disease. Explain to them. Tell them to call you. Call your nurse practitioner. Have everything available information-wise from them. Um, there's a lot of support groups over there, too, that help a lot. And what, what have those shown? It minimizes the effect of dyspnea, interesting enough. It minimizes the effect of shortness of breath on their daily activities. And it reduces the psychological burden of, those, of this population. You're in this together. It's not me. It's not Christine. We are in this together. Like going up and down the stairs. And I say to Christine, when you come down, will you bring me so and so? It's important to also involve palliative, palliative care in the management um, of, of those patients because we're looking into a progressive disease. End of life planning should be discussed in the outpatient, not when they're near intubation in, in our ICUs. And symptom center management is important and a necessary treatment priority. So palliative care is needed. What does it do? It respects the needs, wishes, values, and goals of the patient and the patient's family. It focuses on reducing patient symptoms. 
providing comfort to patients with specific goals of relief from physical and emotional suffering and consideration of psychological and spiritual support for patients and caregivers. It is only chance, really, unless there's something else. I just couldn't come to terms with it. I was getting panic attacks two or three times a week and used to break down, cried like a baby. There were times I just wanted to smash my head against the wall. And this is the anxiety. So what do we still have to offer those patients? Lung transplant is something we still have an option to offer those patients. And this is a patient who's actually waiting for a new set of lungs. How much anxiety they pass, how much anxiety they go through. So what does lung transplant do? It improves quality of life, prolongs survival. We're looking into a five-year survival rate of about 50% after they get transplanted. When to refer is a bit complex. Why? Because as I said earlier, this disease has three scenarios, either stable, progressive, or rapid progressive. And unfortunately, many of the patients are referred too late in the course of the disease. As a general rule, as a general rule, patients with IPF qualify for lung transplant when their post-transplant life expectancy is or exceeds their current life expectancy without a transplant. When to refer? In the beginning. The earlier, the better. You want the lung transplant physician to um, um, have an establishment, of course, if the patient is agreeable, have the workup done. So once you have histopathologic or radiologic evidence um, of the disease, if you have abnormal lung function tests, such as an FVC less than 80%, fusing capacity less than 40%, any shortness of breath or function limitation related to the lung disease, any oxygen requirement, whether it's at rest or whether walking, And at last, you need to make patients aware that there are trials ongoing. The more we're learning about the disease, the more um, um, we're finding pathways, the more we have trials, um, and see if they're willing or if they're out of options and they want to be enrolled in a trial. They ask those questions. Are there any trials coming at your institution? Anything at the sister institution? If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, it gives you the list of all of the trials that are um, enrolling and that, that are being done. And just to summarize um, my talk, I, I, took, I took this from um, a paper that was published by Dr. Perez and Dr. Um, Roman um, back in 2011. It's actually it's a nice diagram of, it's a nice summary how to work up or how to go through the um, disease. So first of all, history and physical examination is very important. Looking into their occupational, environmental um, history, what drugs have they taken, it's very important. Physical examination, lung examination, basilar crackers, do they have clubbing, um, anything that goes with connective tissue disease. Labs, any of their serologies are positive. And then radiology with chest x-ray start with, and then a high-resolution CT scan. Lung function tests helps also in tailoring and narrowing your differential diagnosis. And based on what you have from data over here, refer for a biopsy. And if you're looking into something other than IPF, it's not unreasonable to send them for um, a transbronchial lung biopsy. If you're thinking of sarcoid, as I said, carinomatous lung diseases, send them for a transbronchial um, lung biopsy. If you're looking into um, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis and you don't have anything on the imaging that's shouting out definite UIP, then you're going to need a bigger biopsy. You're going to need a bigger tissue, bigger specimen. Once you have the diagnosis, once you said this patient has UIP, then the disease-modifying therapy or the antifibrotics, of course, with a discussion with patients regarding their side effects, Talk to them about clinical trials that are being done on clinicaltrials.gov. Educate, educate, and educate. Um, patient support programs. Smoking cessation. Look into their comorbidities. Treating their other comorbidities is important. Vaccination. Influenza as well as the pneumonia vaccine. Do they need oxygen? If yes, give them oxygen. Oxygen helps, actually. And pulmonary rehab, too. And as we're advancing more into the disease, 
talk about end-of-life preferences, refer a bit early, but then we start looking into listing them on lung, um, for lung transplant, palliative care involvement, and giving them supplemental oxygen too. <clears throat> I'm going to end my talk with this um, picture I took. This is a sunset in um, California, Coronado Island. And other than it's a beautiful sunset, um, what, I, what I want to say is that it's been more than two decades and we've changed. And there have been a lot of trials. There have been summaries of all the trials just going over the literature. Um, the more we're learning about the disease, the more pathways we're getting, the more trials. So there is a lot more to know there's a lot of more medicine that are likely coming up. Hopefully in the near future we'll have something that would help rather than slow this, this disease. And um, finished a bit early, but I'm, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Fabulous talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, we do have time for questions. I'd like to uh, start off with uh, uh, a comment that uh, shortness of breath is really common. Very common. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a primary care physician, but... Um, I, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, how many times in my own career that I have missed somebody having pulmonary fibrosis because I thought, well, they're short of breath because they were a smoker, or they're short of breath because they're chubby and they're out of shape, you know, whatever. So, so what are some things that, you know, for the person in practice, seeing a lot of people who say, gosh, I get short of breath when I walk up the stairs, I get short of breath when I walk up the stairs. I mean, you know, I mean, how do you decide then, gee whiz, this guy deserves more of a walk up? If you start with imaging and if you start with pulmonary function tests, that would help narrow. It gets to be confusing in patients who are obese. I agree with you. Um, um, but let's say you get that patient and he does not improve on follow-up and we're looking into a short follow-up. Then we start thinking. Um, getting more history from the patient, physical examination, all, all of those would guide us. As much as it's confusing, you need to sit and, and actually dig a little bit more into it. So if you have lung function tests with a low diffusing capacity with lung function tests that are low, and this story does not fit just the morbid obesity, then you're going to need to dig a little bit more into it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry, thank you for the shout-out. So, <laughs> <laughs> sort of observation, and I want to understand what your experience might be. Number one, um, and I really think you underscored this well in your talk, most of our referrals here are from fellow pulmonologists not for the internal medicine so folks, not from the people in the front lines who might see these individuals who have long-standing shortness of breath uh, for a long over time. And we, we do tend to get the patients late. So I would like to know, that's number one, uh, what, what your experience is if you take, you see that, you get these late uh, referrals. Number two, what's really interesting, and especially at the VA, we're doing a lot more lung cancer screening. And it's really interesting that maybe about a fourth of these individuals have acute lung diseases. Now, not necessarily IPF, but that's really ramping up our, our, our work at the VA. It's, it's the serendipitous finding even before they, they even have to submit a discount. You know, the shortest of breath could be from COPD, it could be from heart disease. And the last thing I want to do is wrong somebody with Correct. heart failure. Correct. So what do your referral patterns look like? So, so regarding your... Um, First, first question, yes, it's from, because we're an academic center and this is where multidisciplinary, this is where we know, this is where we have more resources, that's why um, they end up, it's pretty much the same. Um, it's not uncommon that you also even get a patient who's already had a biopsy and then we're stuck with a patient. What do we do? It's, it's a bit complex how we could get those patients from the internists once they start seeing them. I mean, what more awareness is something that we're working on. More, more clues is what we hope for, but as I just said, it's very confusing with how much vague they come. Um, it's nice to have academic institutions in the, in the surrounding. That's, that's how I'm going to answer this um, question. And regarding the, your, your second question is, um, we, we see that it's not uncommon. Yeah. Smokers and smoking being a risk factor, this is why I end up having the yearly CAT scan. And honestly, it depends also if you have a radiologist who actually could point out that there's a fibrotic pattern, they need something to be done, maybe that would you know, give an idea for the internist to send those patients to us because it's not uncommon that this test was done for just lung nodule screening, there's no lung nodules were done. We see that too. So, When following a lung transplantation, do you see the IPF return? Such that is, are, are the patient affecting this new set of lungs like they affected their old set? I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. Perez that question. <laughs> no. 
I just came across those. So this is you know, this is a summary of all the clinical trials. This was a paper just published in 2017. There is a bunch of maps um, that are on this trial. I'm talking about four to five. Rituximab is one of them, but there is other um, um, maps. So immunotherapy is being tried on those those patients.